So a couple weeks back, I received this tweet from B Bacon Bacon. Can you rank the top 10 or 15 highest grossing movies? Yes, B Bacon Bacon, I can do that. So let's talk about it. Hi, if you're new here, my name is Sean Chandler, and I started this channel because I was driving everyone around me crazy talking about movies way too much. If you can relate, you're probably in the right place and consider clicking that subscribe button. With that in mind, go ahead and join me down below in the comment section. Share your ranking of the 15 highest grossing movies of all time. The list of the movies is down below in the description, or you can look right here up on the screen. Going into this, this is the 15 highest grossing films globally not adjusted for inflation. It's interesting looking at the list because 10 of the movies came out in the last five years and only one of the films came out in the 20th century. One final thing before we get started, a bunch of the shirts that I wear in my videos, including this one right here, are available in my merch store. Check it out, see if there's something you enjoy. The link is down below in the description and let's get started. Coming in in last place is Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. Now this is a movie that when I first saw it in the theaters, I had pretty mixed feelings about it. I enjoyed it some of the spectacle of it. I thought Chris Pratt was a little bit more Chris Pratty inside of this film versus the first film. There's some good tension inside of the sequences. The director is pretty good at building tension, a sense of danger and stakes inside of sequences. But the plot that they came up with this, for this movie is not good. And I felt that when I first watched it, but as time has passed, it's a movie that I thought, I don't really want to rewatch that film. I think just even the idea of having the dinosaurs go extinct on the island and having a volcano wipe them out is a pretty distasteful direction to take the Jurassic Park mythology. And then it transitions to this really dumb plot line about <laughs> terrorists buying dinosaurs to attack people or something like that. There's ideas that are just kind of thrown in the mix about human cloning that just don't add anything at all to the story. So this is one that I rewatched to do this video and my wife and I both, as we're like, do we really want to rewatch this film? Because it's a film that just left such a bad taste in our mouths. Even though there are some good things about it, it's easily last on this list. Coming in at number 14 is Star Wars The Last Jedi. Now I don't hate this movie. I don't think it ruined my childhood or anything like that. But I do believe that they took the mythology in a bad direction and executed some of it pretty poorly. Granted, there's some excellent elements inside of this film. The lightsaber throne room battle sequence is phenomenal. The color schemes and a number of the scenes are very cool. Mark Hamill might give his best performance that he has ever given in any film ever. But at the same time, I do not like the direction that they took his character. It doesn't feel like the logical extension of who we saw in the previous films. I think that there's some big story problems with the Poe Dameron plot line and the casino side tour. All of that stuff doesn't quite make a whole lot of sense. And so even though this is a movie that has things that are really good... I really wish they had gone in almost any different direction with it. While I can appreciate that they wanted to subvert my expectations, I don't think that they came up with something better than my expectations. They just did something unexpected and different, and they made some clunky mistakes in the execution of that. So this movie was very disappointing for me. And number 13 is Beauty and the Beast, the live action remake. I was actually pretty surprised to see this film on the list because it's a film that apparently showed up in theaters, made an enormous amount of money, and people don't really talk about it anymore. It's, it's a sh kind of a strange phenomenon, just how successful this film was at the box office, how much it made opening weekend in the United States. And then, if you're gonna watch Beauty and the Beast, you just watch the original one. Whereas even the two films lower on this list than this one were very divisive films. They made a lot of people mad. They were not happy with the direction they took Jurassic World or Star Wars with those films but at least it elicited a response from people. People were passionate about those films, loving them or hating them, but Beauty and the Beast was one that we all kind of went to and we went, okay, that was pretty cool. That was Beauty and the Beast, live action. A couple extra songs, they're not too bad. And some of the production design is quite good. Uh, Emma Watson is charming in the lead role, but beyond that, there wasn't anything that made any sort of mark on people. It doesn't stick in your mind because it's literally just translating an animated film to live action. And so while it's a film that 
I don't have any big issues with it besides the auto-tune on Emma Watson's voice. It's just just there. I don't know why I would ever want to rewatch it instead of the animated film. And so that's a very interesting to me that it's on this list. Number 12 is Furious 7. Of all the films on this list, this is the one that has the highest percentage of its money made outside of the United States. So what that means is this movie was kind of, it was a hit in the US, but it was a mega hit around the rest of the globe, which is interesting in and of itself that this Fast and Furious franchise, which started as just a street racing, mid-budget type thing, has turned into these global blockbusters that people around the globe apparently love to go out and buy tickets for them. This one was unfortunately or tragically probably helped by the untimely death of Paul Walker, and so that kind of gave the movie a certain sense of extra intrigue and interest, and people wanted to kind of honor his legacy and see his final film, and that helped things out a little bit. As for the film itself, re-watching it over the last week, Week. Um, I mean, it's not a great film, but it is what I call a Taco Bell film. Absolutely. There's a sh couple of shoestring plot lines in there that tie together a whole bunch of these absurd, ludicrous action sequences that are a ton of fun to watch. This is not high art, great cinema. This is junk food. Delicious, delicious junk food that's a ton of fun to eat. You just don't want to think about it too much. Next up is Avengers Age of Ultron. This is a movie that made insane amounts of money, but because the bar had been set so high by the first Avengers, it still kind of came off as a disappointment. As generally speaking, people feel that the original Avengers was a better film, and this one is a little bit clunky in the execution. Ultron was a bit disappointing, and I would agree with all of those sentiments, but this is still a very fun blockbuster. It's got all the quips that you want. It has all of the massive action sequences, all these characters that you love to see on screen. All of it is present inside of this film. There's just probably a bit too much stuff going on, so you don't get to fully appreciate all any of the specific plot lines because it moves from one to the next one so quickly. But it's still one that I understand why people would want to see it on the big screen, why it's such a big blockbuster, while being a bit disappointing to a lot of people. Kicking off the top 10 is Avatar, one of the strangest film phenomena of all time. It's insane to me just how much money this movie made because I know very few people that love this movie. Most people are like, that's a pretty good film, fantastic effects, you gotta see it on the big screen. But I don't know very many people at all that rewatch it at home. I saw it in the theater three times. The first time I rewatched it um, since the theaters was two weeks ago in preparation for this video. I had not seen it at home ever prior to that because it just wasn't something that appealed to me because the story of it is so familiar. Dances with Wolves, Fern Gully, Pocahontas, The Last Samurai, they all have this exact same story structure, exact same story beats, exact same certain characters at certain points in time in the story, in which case it's a movie that just doesn't make a big impact on me when it's not on the big screen, yet somehow this is the movie that has set insane box office records. And rewatching it at home, it just kind of affirmed all of my feelings about it. It's executed very well, amazing visuals, very cool action sequences, and a very familiar plot line that I've seen many times before. I've said this before, but of the actual James Cameron films, the one, because he did Piranha 2, but of the ones that are like actual his kind of vision, this is my least favorite out of all of them. I enjoy The Abyss and of course all the Terminator True Lies, all of that stuff more than Avatar because they were telling original stories and doing something that I hadn't seen before. Whereas this one, it's a story I've seen before with a skin on top of it that was blue, <laughs> which is not the most intriguing to me. I should add, I'm pretty resentful about the Avatar films because I love James Cameron films so much and he's made one movie in the last 22 years because he got kidnapped and taken off to Pandora and he stopped making movies. So that's frustrating to me that we don't have way more James Cameron films and we only have this one Avatar film. Coming in at number nine is Jurassic World. This might be the film that caused me to invent the term Taco Bell movies. 
and I mentioned that before with Furious 7, but these are movies that we all have the junk food that we like. We all have the fast food that we like to go eat. Maybe it's McDonald's for you. Maybe it's Subway. Maybe it's Chick-fil-A. My family, every Sunday, we have Taco Bell for lunch. My tacos are always soggy. They always leave something out, but we eat it every single Sunday, and somehow it's delicious even when it's awful. And we have those movies that we can't defend. Some people call them guilty pleasures, but I don't feel guilty about any of the movies that I enjoy. They're Taco Bell movies for me, and Jurassic World is one of those ones for me. Now, some people think it's too ludicrous, too stupid, characters are too flat, too cardboard, not interesting enough. For me, Chris Pratt rides on a motorcycle with velociraptors to attack a genetically engineered a uh, dinosaur monster thing, and then he partners up with a T-Rex to battle it with Velociraptors, and then at the end of it, the T-Rex and the Velociraptors like give each other like a head bob deal. That is a delicious Taco Bell movie for me right there. I can't defend it. If you don't like this, I get it. I totally understand where you're coming from, but this is a movie that I can put on at any point in time and have an enormous amount of fun with. Dumb, absolutely delicious, Absolutely. Number eight is Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part Two. I've mentioned this before on my channel. I'm not a big Harry Potter fan. That's not one of the worlds that I've gotten super invested in, but I do appreciate the franchise and can have fun watching the movies. And because my wife is a fanatic about Harry Potter, I've seen all the films many, 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 many times over the years, and it came to a nice, conclusion with this particular film. And even to, it's interesting that this is the only one that is on the list. And you got to wonder, is that because it was the last film in the franchise? So everyone had this big push to go see it. How much of that is that it's the last one to come out and ticket price inflation is what kind of pushed it over the edge onto the list. I don't know specifically what it is, but it is one of the best films in the franchise. Therefore, it's kind of a good thing that it's one of the ones that made quite a bit of money. But whether you're talking about the fact that we finally get the payoff of seven previous films leading up to the showdown with Voldemort, we get the almost the destruction of Hogwarts when everything that kind of goes on, the payoff of so many plot lines and everything, and it all comes to a nice conclusion. We have that final little epilogue too where we see everybody ends up. So it's a film that, uh, it's not one that I normally choose to put on, but I, it, when my wife does, I'm totally fine with it and it works for me. Next up is Frozen, the highest grossing animated film of all time. And it plays into so many of the classic tropes of Disney princess films while turning the tropes on their heads at the exact same time. And in doing so makes for a very charming, fun, funny story. It potentially could have been a good bit higher up on this list because there's so many good things about it when you're talking about some of the fantastic songs, Let It Go, well, most of the songs in this one besides the troll songs are really good. Potentially this film could have been higher up on the list because it does have some fantastic songs, some good laughs, some great little side characters in it, but it's also a film that is very clunky in its structure. And I've heard some stories about the process by which the film was made and written and restructured and it made more sense to me how the film turned out the way it did even as you go through it uh, the first half of the film is like non-stop musical and then the second half has like one song in it it's like they figured out all the endpoints that they wanted to get to with the story but it's kind of weird how they get to them and when certain reveals happen but still it's a film that is just a great little family film that pays off in the end earns its conclusion and most importantly it's a film that does something different with the disney princess tropes and then we've got black panther earlier i said that furious 7 was the film on this list that they had the highest percentage of its money coming from overseas. Black Panther is the film on this list that had the highest percentage that came specifically from the United States. Just to some interesting facts inside of the mix on this one. But real quick, let it sink in that the only standalone superhero movie that is on this list is Black Panther. You've got a bunch of Avengers movies, but as for a solo single character, it's not Superman, not Batman, not Spider-Man. It's Black Panther, and that's a great example of how studio heads and general audiences aren't very good at predicting what we actually want and what we will buy tickets for, and that if you make a good movie, if you make a movie that kind of taps into different audiences and has broad appeal and is exciting and uses people's brains and has some dra drama and tragedy to it, 
People will go and see it. This is a film that shouldn't be this successful. If you'd asked us 10 years ago, which superheroes movie is going to be on this list and get nominated for Best Picture? I don't know that anyone even would have had Black Panther on their radar, but here we are. If you make a good movie, people will go and see it and you make a lot of money. Bringing us into the top five is Titanic. This is the only film on this list from the 20th century for a long time. It was the number one movie globally and then Avatar topped it and then it has recently been surpassed by Endgame. But this is a movie that if you just stop and think about, like look at this list, it's a bunch of franchise films, it's a bunch of popcorn films, a, movie, a bunch of movies about heroes stopping bad guys. And then in the middle of it, you've got Titanic a movie about a whole bunch of people dying a tragic death. So in and of itself, it's interesting that just how successful this film was. In re-watching it, I was kind of timing when things happened inside of the film. You don't go back to the year 2012 in the film, to the Titanic, until 20 minutes into the movie. Jack and Rose don't meet each other until 40 minutes into the film, and the ship does not hit the iceberg until an hour and 40 minutes into the film. Stuff like that's just kind of interesting to me. I don't know if it's interesting to you, but so many levels that shouldn't work. You should have, you should get to the Titanic quicker. Our two leads should meet each other very earlier in the film. The big event that drives the plot should happen sooner, but it doesn't. It plays against everything that you would say should happen, ought to happen, that every screenwriter person would tell you you should do. And because of it, they made this movie that made bonkers amounts of money. Now, I would say they probably should have tightened up the first part of the film a little bit. It can drag at times, especially when it takes 20 minutes to actually get to um, the start of our story. But once the ship hits that iceberg, this movie is incredibly effective. You feel the tension, you feel the emotion, the tragedy, all of that amount of buildup over the, the first hour and a half of the film makes you care about certain characters. You see the hints of arrogance, the hints of what could go wrong here. It's very well crafted to elicit all of the emotions that you want for you. And they found a way to make individual people represent the different types of tragedies that would have happened on the Titanic. Whether you're talking about babies dying, whether you're talking about families being torn apart, all the sorts of things, they capture it in a way that um, it makes sense that this film was one that people kept going back to. Now it's easy to pick on the movie that they turned an actual tragedy about hundreds of people dying into a tragedy about a broken relationship between two people that just met each other. But as I said, it works for what it's going for. Coming in at number four is Avengers Endgame, the film that has become such a runaway success that it led to the creation of this video right here. It's no surprise that this film is on the list as it's the culmination of the most popular franchise at the box office right now. It's combining all these different franchises. They had such a great cliffhanger end to the previous film inside of the series, leading to this event film that delivers. Uh, it's epic in size. It has massive fan fiction. Like, I, you, I don't know how you do fan fiction more potently than the third act of this film because they spent 11 years building up to these payoffs, setting little pieces out here like you, oh, I want to see this happen inside of an Avengers movie at some point in time. And then finally they gave it to you inside of this film. So this one right here, uh, I can't imagine a movie this year being more enjoyable for me. I've got a couple gripes with it as to why it's not a perfect film, but it is a movie that absolutely delivers on what I want from a blockbuster this movie gave to me. Real quick before I give you my top three, remember to share your ranking down below in the comment section. We're going to disagree and that's the fun part. Just don't be a weirdo or a jerk down in the comment section. Also, after this video, if you've enjoyed this ranking, check out this video up above. It's a video where I picked my favorite movie from every year that I've been alive. So if you wanna know what my favorites are, check out that video and see how weird my taste in movies are or how normal my taste in movies are. If you enjoyed this one, there's something in there that you'll like. In third place is Star Wars The Force Awakens. I know with time, some people have kind of soured on this film and they've soured entirely on the sequels and have issues with Disney, Star Wars and all that fun stuff. 
I loved this movie when I first saw it in the theater, and I still love it to this day. It just goes back to the fun side of Star Wars. Does it play it safe with the story? Absolutely. Does it rehash A New Hope? Absolutely. Does it deliver the experience that I want from a Star Wars film? Yes, it does. And I think that this is what J.J. Abrams is good at, is creating movies that are like roller coasters, that once it starts, you're just on this ride from beginning to end. And that's what this movie did for me. It had the nostalgia. It had the cool action sequences, especially like the escape from Jakku and the Millennium Falcon. Very cool, exciting sequence. And the whole movie's kind of like that, that he just has a great sense of visuals, of action. He's got a snappy sense of humor. It's kind of low-hanging fruit humor, but it works inside of this universe. So for me, it might not be the best Star Wars movie. It might be derivative, but it doesn't change the fact that it delivers what I want from a Star Wars film, and I'm very excited to see what he delivers with The Rise of the Skywalker. Our runner-up is The Avengers. Honestly, I didn't love the trailers for this film, so while I was excited for it based off the concept of actually doing this big team-up movie, the trailers had left me kind of underwhelmed. And then I showed up opening night to the movie and it, it just kind of blew me away. Uh, Joss Whedon had this long history of doing TV shows where he worked with ensembles and kind of wrote little quippy dialogue for everybody. And with this film, he brought his A game. You, whether you're talking about the witty banter between all of the team members, whether you're talking about all of these little fan uh, fair moments that you want inside of these films of watching our different Avengers face off against each other, or whether you're talking about the phenomenal third act that uh, just gets to be, our heroes just get to be heroic inside of it. Everybody gets a moment in the spotlight to be the hero, to do something really cool. There's still humor inside of the third act. It's not like they put humor on the back burner and then the uh, action get, takes the front seat. No, no, it's still funny. You get these ridiculous things that shouldn't work, like Hulk punching Thor or Hulk grabbing Loki and slamming him on the ground. That should come off so cringeworthy but it pays off inside this film. It works in the tone that they created. So for me, this is a movie that just puts a big grin on my face every single time. I think it holds up. Its simplicity is part of its charm, and it is a great blockbuster. But coming in in first place is Avengers Infinity War. It's got the humor, it's got the action, it's got an even bigger team up. Add to the mix a phenomenal villain and tragedy into it, and you just get a special film. For me, like everyone else, I'd been waiting for this film for so long. After 10 years of building the foundation and the framework and building towards this film, they delivered it, and for me, it, it paid off. It has everything that I want from a comic book movie, from a blockbuster. It took chances. It took risks. It had a very tragic ending. Our heroes lose. I know some people had some issues with where the movie ended and the cliffhanger nature of it. Didn't feel like it was a complete story. That wasn't my read on it. It always felt like a complete story to me. The story about who will get the Infinity Stones. The answer to that is Thanos inside of this one, and so therefore our heroes lost, and we need a second story to undo what he did. So all of it worked for me. I saw this, when I saw it in the theater, I thought to myself, either the next movie is going to make this one just solidify it as a classic for me, or the next one could screw this one up. Luckily, Endgame absolutely built off of this film and amplified it for me. So for me, I, I love the character interactions, the big epic sequences. It's a tragic ending. So for me, of all of the highest grossing movies of all time, this is number one for me, the one that has delivered the most satisfying cinematic experience and delivered what it promised to deliver to me. This one did it the best. Remember to check out that video right over there where I share my picks for my favorite movie from every year that I have been alive. You can also find out how old I am by watching that video and doing some simple math. Thank you so much for watching and keep talking movies too much.